This presentation is entitled, Enhancement of the Screening Examination of the Fetal Heart as Proposed by the ISOG Practice Guidelines, published in June, of 2023. The presentation will be divided into three parts. Part 1 will describe two techniques to image the aortic arch. Part 2 will discuss a simple technique to measure the size of the four-chamber view. Part 3 will discuss how to differentiate a pericardial effusion from a hypoechogenic rim. Part 1. Identification of the continuity of the ascending aorta with the aortic arch during the screening examination of the fetal heart. To exclude structural malformations of the aortic arch and pulmonary artery there are three principles that should be considered. 1. As the aorta and main pulmonary artery immediately exit their respective ventricles, they should be perpendicular to each other. 2. The main pulmonary artery should demonstrate bifurcation into the right and the left pulmonary arteries as well as the ductus arteriosus entering the descending aorta just below the left subclavian artery. 3. The aorta should demonstrate vessels exiting from the arch of the aorta to the head and upper body. Using the current screening protocol illustrated in the guidelines, two of the three criteria are met. Criterion 1. The perpendicular relationship of the ascending aorta and main pulmonary artery is identified from the three-vessel view in which the long axis of the main pulmonary artery is perpendicular to the short axis of the aorta, as illustrated in Figure 7 of the guidelines. Criterion 2. The branching of the right and left pulmonary arteries exiting the main pulmonary artery is identified in the three-vessel view as illustrated in Figure 7 of the guidelines. Criterion 3. Although a portion of the transverse aortic arch is visualized at the level of the tracheal view, as illustrated in Figure 9 of the guidelines, the aortic arch is not completely visualized, therefore precluding the exclusion of an interrupted aortic arch. Simultaneously identifying the continuity of the ascending aorta with the aortic arch using two of the five reference images from the guidelines. Option 1. Imaging the aortic arch using the left ventricular outflow tract as the reference image before rotating the transducer 45 degrees. These are images from the ISAW guidelines. Figure 2 illustrates the five suggested image planes for the screening examination. The five images do not include imaging the continuity between the ascending aorta and the transverse aortic arch, but only images the left outflow tract as it exits the left ventricle, as illustrated by the yellow arrows in Figure 6, and the transverse aortic arch at the level of the three-vessel and trachea view, as illustrated by the white arrows in Figure 8. To image the aortic arch requires the interventricular septum to be perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. This illustrates moving the transducer over the maternal abdominal wall to image the fetal heart so the septum is perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. This illustrates rotation of the ultrasound transducer 45 degrees from the left ventricular outflow tract to image the aortic arch. After rotation of the transducer 45 degrees, the continuity between the ascending aorta and the transverse arch is confirmed as indicated by the yellow rectangle in the image on the right. Once the aortic arch is identified, the transducer is rocked to image the main pulmonary artery exiting the right ventricle. This confirms the aorta and main pulmonary artery are perpendicular to each other as they exit their respective ventricles. This illustrates the outflow tracks perpendicular to each other as they exit their respective ventricles. On the left is the normal aortic arch after rotating the transducer 45 degrees to image the left outflow tract view. On the right is a fetus with deep transposition of the great arteries in which, as the transducer began its 45 degree rotation, 
demonstrated the vessel exiting the left ventricle bifurcating into the right and left pulmonary arteries. This view confirms detransposition of the great arteries. With further rotation along the axis of the outflow tract exiting the left ventricle, the aorta, located superiorly, and main pulmonary artery, located inferiorly, can be observed to be parallel as they exit their respective ventricular chambers instead of being perpendicular to each other. This compares the normal crossing of the outflow tracts on the left and the parallel vessels in detransposition on the right. Option 2. Imaging the aortic arch using the transverse aortic arch imaged in the three-vessel tracheal view as the reference image before rotating the transducer 90 degrees. The video clip illustrates option 2 in which the transducer is rotated 90 degrees from the transverse arch to image the full aortic arch. To accomplish the above, the examiner first identifies the four-chamber view when the ventricular septum is perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. The transducer is then directed towards the fetal head in a transverse plane until the three-vessel and trachea view is identified. Once identified, the transverse aorta should be parallel to the ultrasound beam as indicated by the yellow line in figure B. The transducer is then rotated 90 degrees to image the aorta, as illustrated in figure C. Part 2. Measuring the size of the four-chamber view to identify cardiomegaly. Identification of cardiomegaly is important because of the long list of associated fetal abnormalities. This describes three methods to measure the end diastolic area of the four-chamber view using either the point-to-point -point trace method, figure A, ellipse tool, figure B, or the two-diameter method, Figure C. I prefer the two diameter method as a screening tool because it takes less time, and also allows for the measurement of the width, length and global sphericity index which assesses the shape of the four chamber view. One method to assess the size of the heart is to measure the area of the heart and chest. This method assumes the chest is normal. However, it does not provide information regarding whether the heart is actually increased in size, but only infers this from the heart to chest ratio. If the ratio is abnormal, then the size of the heart needs to be determined to see if it's actually enlarged. Figure A. This demonstrates a heart-to-chest ratio equal to 30%, which is normal. Figure B. This demonstrates measurement of the heart width and area are greater than the 99th percentile. These images are from the same fetus at 26 and 36 weeks of gestation. At 26 weeks the end diastolic width of the heart was increased in z-score of 1.83 and corresponding centile of 96.67. However, the area was at the 85th centile. At 36 weeks the width was still above the 90th centile with the area at the 95th centile. The fetus had a pericardial effusion which was also associated with increased pulmonary artery resistance as manifest by notching at the top of the pulmonary artery Doppler waveform a classic finding that has been reported in newborns and adults with pulmonary hypertension. From my experience, notching of the main pulmonary artery is commonly seen in fetuses with growth restriction. Part 3. Differentiating a pericardial effusion from a hypoechogenic rim. Figure A illustrates both a pericardial effusion and hypoechogenic rim. Figure B demonstrates the pericardial effusion as a color overlay in green, the hypoechogenic rim in red, and normal fluid at the atrioventricular junction in yellow. Figure A illustrates a clip of a normal four-chamber view. Notice the thickness of the ventricular walls. Figure B illustrates the theoretical size of a 2 mm effusion, indicated in yellow, 
along the right and left ventricular walls. From this diagram in figure B, a 2 mm pericardial effusion is quite large compared to the ventricular walls. In the second trimester fetus a 1 mm pericardial effusion would be significant. Therefore, the 2 mm rule should be discarded as criteria for the significance of a pericardial effusion. These clips illustrate the evolution of a pericardial effusion in a fetus with anti-cal antibody who subsequently required delivery because of fetal anemia. At 28 weeks the middle cerebral artery peak velocity was normal. The four-chamber view demonstrates pericardial fluid at the atrioventricular junction which is normal. At 32 weeks the peak velocity suggested mild fetal anemia and a pericardial effusion is observed dissecting down the right ventricular wall. This represents the early stage of a pericardial effusion. At 33 weeks, the peak velocity is in moderate range for fetal anemia and the pericardial effusion is now larger along the right ventricular wall. This illustrates how the M mode can be used to differentiate between a hypoechogenic rim and a true pericardial effusion. The M mode demonstrates separation of the epicardium from the pericardium only during ventricular systole and diastole along the right ventricular wall. The hypoechogenic rim, however, is present and is the same size during systole and diastole as represented by the yellow stars. In this example, the pericardial effusion in figure A, was associated with hollow systolic tricuspid regurgitation as indicated by the yellow arrows in figure B. This is commonly observed in fetuses with growth restriction. Another method to identify a true pericardial effusion is to use color or power Doppler ultrasound. Because of movement of the pericardial fluid during systole and diastole, the color of the Doppler movement of pericardial fluid is opposite in color to blood flow within the ventricular chambers. I hope this brief summary will allow you to enhance the screening examination of the fetal heart.